recording now and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, present. Okay. Let me do this again. Present. Okay. Do you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And oh, shoot. Where is my mouse? <laughs> I can't find my mouse. There is it right there. Here's it right here. And okay. There we go. Okay, so here, early Asian American history. Um, so just starting off, uh, have you heard of the term perpetual foreigner? Yeah. Yeah? Can mm -hmm. you give me like what your idea is, like what your um, notion, your definition of what the perpetual foreigner is? Um, it's basically like the idea of, I guess, like stratifying different um, like racial ethnic groups in America and basically Asians and Latinx, the community is kind of seen as like always a foreigner, regardless of whether they're like born here, if their family is established. Um, it's just kind of like, oh, white people, black people are like part of America, whereas like Asian and Latinx groups are not. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, that sounds about right. And just like trivia, do you know who the picture in, or like who the person in that picture is? No. No? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna pull up my notes real quick on this because I had it written. And that's great. My notes are not there. All right. Okay. Let's just, let's do this. Let's do this from the beginning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, we're gonna give you giving a topic on early Asian American history. Uh, I'm Nan Quach. I am the person that's actually in this class, and this is Adela. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, Adela, you want to just give like quick thing about yourself? Maybe just like where you go. Okay. Yeah. For sure. Hi, I'm Adela. I am a rising senior at UCLA. I know Nan from high school. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Why can't I get my speaker notes? There it is, speaker notes. Okay, so um, have you heard of the phrase perpetual foreigner? If you have, can you give me like what your definition or what your like notion of the term means? Yeah, that's actually funny because I just did like a little bit of research on this like term and concept. Mm -hmm. um, but from my understanding, basically what it is, is it's like um, a concept in kind of like racial grouping and stratification in America and um, it's kind of the idea that Asian Americans and Latinx Americans are always seen as like a foreigner, regardless of whether they were born here, if their family's established here, whether they speak the English or not. It's like a oh, white and black people are like quintessentially American versus Asian and Latinx people who are not. Yeah, very good, very good definition, very good. <laughs> um, do you know who the person in this picture is right now? No. Okay, so just, Interesting trivia. This is um, a character in the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. His name is uh, Mr. Yuniyoshi, if I'm saying that right. And um, who do you think is playing him? This I'm is really bad at people. <laughs> it looks vaguely like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so who, like, do you think his character is Asian? Does it look Asian? Okay, yeah. So I asked another person about this earlier. It's like, oh, do you think this is an Asian person? And they're like, yeah, do you think this is an Asian person playing him? All right, that's the second question. Do you think it's an Asian person playing him? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought the name, I thought the character is Asian from the name and the actor does not look Asian. Yeah, so that's kind of it. So it's a white person playing this Asian character and it has a lot of controversies in like the modern age because like, there's so many Asian stereotypes in it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was asking another person earlier. It's like, do you think this is an Asian person playing this character? And they're like, yeah, it is. And I'm like, oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I think the actor's name is Mickey Romney. I have Mitt Romney on here, but that's not right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, just kind of like getting your ideas. Like, do you think, what, do you, what are your opinions on the term perpetual foreigner? Or like the ideas it conveys? I think it's a really good way of looking at it. I think that it 
might like shine a different light on how we view race just because I think a lot of people um, especially with like Prop 16 and stuff like that they're like oh like Asian Americans are already like I guess like model minority they're already like at the highest point you can get as a minority group like oh they do so good like academically economically but if you look at it from this light you can see that this is like kind of the not really the root but like one of the aspects of like where that discrimination might come from yeah okay so on the topic of race um how would you define race um race I don't know the actual definition, but I'm pretty sure it has something to do with um, like just basically physical, like your physical attributes, like how you look like that kind of defines your race, um, things like skin color. It's very much a social culture that doesn't exist in real life or it does exist because people made it, but it doesn't exist biologically. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're getting at. I know what you think, and I definitely agree on that. Um, we can go back to the topic later. Uh, I have my notes about like what race is and whatnot. Um, do you know who the people in this image are? I do not. Yeah, so this is um, Omi and Wanat. They're kind of like pioneers in the whole racial formation theory and like individuals who kind of came up with that term or coined the term, possibly not coined, possibly getting my historical facts wrong, but yeah, they are kind of like pioneers in that whole theory and kind of like formulating like what race is and how race comes to be. So we can go back onto that, but now getting into like the meat of everything. Um, when do you think Asian people first settled into America? And of Asian people, who do you think were the first to settle America? Oh gosh, I'm really bad at history. It's all okay. um, it was a long time ago. Very and nice. Who I think the first people were, probably people who were like walking on the street or whatever. Okay, so like the ice bridge from yeah. like the continent. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's very, very long time ago. We're going like cross con Pangea <laughs> type. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um Good answer. Not exactly where I was getting at. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure those people would be classified as Native American now because it's mm, that long ago. Uh -huh. right. <laughs> but um, so kind of getting at this idea of um, these Manila men, or have you ever heard of the term of Manila men? I don't think so. Okay. Um, where do you think the word comes from? Um... Isn't Manila a city in Philippines? Okay, very good, very good. And so what does that kind of imply about like where I'm getting at? Like who did the first Asian people settle into America? They were probably Filipino. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> do you want to guess a time period? Yes. 1800s. 1800s, okay. So surprisingly, um, these people settled into America, like settled, settled around the 15th century, which was like before even the US was the US, really. It was still like possibly colonial times. I'm really bad at dates too. So yeah, like around colonial times. So these people, these Filipino people who called themselves at the time, Indios Luzonos rather than Filipino, uh, came on board the Spaniard ships when the Spaniards are trying to like colonize America. Uh, however, like along the colonies, like working conditions and just like the overall conditions weren't that great. So a lot of these um, Indios uh, Luzonos, I'm saying this wrong, I'm so sorry, but like um, they jumped aboard ship and they jumped aboard ship in the bayou or which would be now be known as Louisiana around the 15th century. So these people had settled within the bayou within Louisiana before Louisiana was even a part of the U.S. before the U.S. was even a thing. And kind of what does that fact or like how do you feel about that fact? What do you think? Um, well I guess given the context of what we started with the perpetual foreigner it 
makes it a little bit contradictory to view like Asians and Asian Americans as like foreigners if we were here before America even started. And so given that, like, so we kind of talked about how Filipino people, they didn't really identify themselves as Filipino or these specific Filipino people, they identified themselves first as like Indios, Muslims, but then they kind of reshaped their identity to be called Manila men, one, because of what she said, it was a city within the Philippines, and two, the Spaniard ship that they were part of was known as the Manila. And when they jumped aboard ship, they referred to themselves as the Manila men, as you can see, like the Manila village store. How do you think these people kind of like identify themselves though? Was there like a racial category they identified themselves as? Did they kind of like identify themselves as the first Americans or how do you think they viewed themselves? Um, I guess if they knew they were in a different country and I would assume that they were probably like proud of themselves and be like, oh my God, like we're the first people here. Uh -huh. um, in regards to race, if it was a Spanish, Spanish ship and like Spanish people were there, there was probably that type of like racial distinction um, amongst themselves though. I feel like probably they didn't really have a need to like distinguish themselves. Yeah. Okay. And when you think like the US became like bought out Louisiana, do you think there was a lot of interaction between these Manila men and like American settlers, like white people? I think so. Like if they've already been established there and they're like the people who've been there and like are predominantly the community, then I think whoever's like coming to buy out the land would have to interact with them to like make it happen. And do you think these relations were like positive, negative? Um, I'm guessing there has to be some of both. Like, I'm not exactly sure what the circumstances were because I'm not familiar with the history, but I'm just going off of like American history is probably not the most peaceful and they were probably like not happy letting go of like their land. Uh -huh. And so do you think like they were heavily discriminated upon? Most likely, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Yeah. And do you think they were discriminated upon based off of like this idea like they weren't white? Yeah. Okay. So incidentally, that was uh, not how it happened. Um, oh. There was a lot of like what we would refer to as interracial mingling, right? So um, can you see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah. So this person right here, right? Uh, her name is Rhonda Ryukes. And she is the sixth generation descendant of Manila men who had previously like colonized or like settled in the area. Um, and you can see like, this is a very like intermixed family right here. This is her family. And you can see like some people with very distinct Filipino characteristics and some people with very like what we'd refer to as white characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, like you would imagine that like with kind of the racial history that we have of America and like what we have grown to know about how America and how race identity works, there would not, this would not exist. Like this is like early, mid 19th century, or like not 19th century, 20th century, so like 1940s-ish, mm -hmm. right? And you clearly see these people are interacting quite well with each other. 1940s was not a very nice time to be not a white person. <laughs> yeah. And so it's kind of this weird thing where you see these people mingling together even though these are clearly like what we would perceive as different races right and we have to keep in mind too with that at the time even before this like she's six generations in like before then like several decades ago interracial marriage was prohibited was banned right in 1806 when u.s acquired louisiana um interracial marriage was explicitly banned from a quick wikipedia search and uh yeah, it was like acceptable for these people that we would now refer to as like Filipino to be marrying into these white families. So how do you think like these people kind of saw themselves like the descendants of Manila men? Um, maybe they saw themselves more as like white Spanish in a sense, rather than descending from like 
the Philippines or like Asia. Yeah. So that's like kind of like a perfect summary. Like um, there was a documentary that I had to watch for this class where there were the descendants of these Manila men and they clearly and like explicitly call themselves white first and American first and Filipino second. Yeah. And so kind of like just seeing how this is, like what do you think of like your definition or like your concept of what race is? Um, I guess it has to do a lot with like self-identification then. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if these individuals were not in the bayou, were not in Louisiana, where like their ancestors had already like settled here, do you think they would have been welcome in America though? Probably not. Yeah. So let's keep that in mind and then go to the next slide. Have you ever heard of this word right here? Yes. I, I don't know what it means at the top of my head. It's, yeah. Uh -huh. So the word, um, it is now used derogatory, derogatively to refer to an Asian person. It's not as common as some other words that I'm pretty sure like we'd be aware of, but it has a, a history of referring to these South Asian or Chinese laborers who had come into the US around the 19th century. Um, the word itself, according to like a quick Google search, has roots meaning slave or labor. And so why did these South Asian and Chinese laborers come to the US? What do you think so? Was it the railroads? Because of the railroads, okay. But like, why do you think they like emigrated out of like their native country? Like, why do you think like the diaspora had occurred? Um, probably to seek opportunities, like maybe they weren't doing too well economically in their like home countries. Maybe there was some type of like disaster, I guess, like economically there. Mm -hmm. And don't mean to like interrogate you, but like, where do you think these disasters began from? Or like, why do you think these disasters occurred? Is it colonialism? <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of where I was going to get at with this. Mm -hmm. So um, how familiar are you with like kind of European expansionism? I know very big base basics. Uh -huh. uh, can you spitball some like Asian colonies set up by like Europeans on top of your head or like places that like Europe had tried to conquer? pretty much everything i know like indochina was like a whole region and then like there was vietnam of course uh -huh. all of asia yeah. yeah so um going back to my notes uh you have like the british east indies and the dutch east indy companies setting up like very aggressive trade routes along like pretty much all of asia right because mm -hmm. asia had a lot of desirable resources especially spices that these European countries wanted to access and having access to these resources provided them a lot of like economic resources, like a lot of economic prosperity, granted at the expense of these Asian countries. And so what ends up happening is that these Asian companies, Asian countries don't want these companies, don't want these European like traders to really set up posts and like set up kind of mock colonies within the country which ends up leading to a lot of bloodshed, a lot of war, and because of possible um, government political inner turmoil, inner turmoil with kind of how successful and how militant these European countries are, it leads to kind of the downfall of these pre-established Asian empires. And that in turn leads to what is now known as the kind of coolie labor trade and just using that term like for historical purposes and for um, to identify what we're talking about. And you have kind of this coercive mixed with some voluntary mixed with basically just historical aspects of why these people had to move out of the country because due to sort of this colonialism and imperialism, you had a very big movement and push for people within the country to kind of disperse out for opportunity and or you had these people who push these individuals out of their country and are now exploiting them for cheap labor 
in their colonies abroad. And what you end up with is even greater turmoil and even greater tension of even greater empires who which had previously, or nations and societies which had previously existed within Asia. Are you familiar with the term of the opium wars? Mm -hmm. And can you give me a little bit about like your background with what the opium wars were about? Yeah, you see my history knowledge, anything I've learned at school kind of went. I just know opium is a drug and they fought over the drug. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's pretty much like if we give like a really basic rundown summary of it, that is what it's about. Um, do you know why they had fought over this drug or you want to give your guess? Was it worth a lot of money? Yeah, so money was a very big part of it. Yeah, so um, China, right? Like going back to the history of China, China has existed as an empire for a very, 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 very long time now. And they were very well established, right? But within China, you had a lot of very desirable resources such as tea, porcelain, and other materials. They also had very well intricate trade routes in the country and they were very economically prosperous, right? So they really didn't have a reason to kind of open up their trade to like international because then they were doing very well within their own country. However, you have like nations such as Britain who really, really, really wanted to penetrate the country and to get the resources for that and like to kind of take over the economic prosperity that they had, right? But how would they be able to do this? Through drugs, you know, implementing drugs into a foreign nation and making them dependent upon it. Very mm -hmm. good way of kind of shifting the power. And um, so what happens is that opium, which is also illegal to grow within Britain and trade and sell within Britain, uh, becomes one of the prime like products that Britain is trading with China, even though it's also illegal to trade in China. What you have, what you get is a growing increase of amount of people within China growing dependent upon opium. But of course, China doesn't like this. So you have Chinese officials beginning a huge crackdown against opium. And what you end up with was a very angry Britain, angry over the fact that China had basically confiscated and removed and tossed away tons and tons of their product, mind you, illegal product in both country. Mm -hmm. And they started a war over each other. And as we mentioned before, Europe, especially Britain at this time, was a huge naval power. They end up winning the war. They set up a series of unequal treaties. The first treaty, um, China wasn't able to meet the demands initially, which led to the second opium war, which led to even further treaties. And if we just kind of summarize what the treaties did, it legalized opium so more people could become dependent upon it. It increased taxes immensely within the country because, or within China, because basically Britain bill China, the bill of the war, including having to pay off foreign countries, which may have been involved in the war, such as France. Uh, China had to give up some land, think of Hong Kong. And also China had to set up a series of ex or extra ports, which had to trade with Britain primarily because Britain was like written into the treaties to become the favored trade partner of China. And so Basically, with that, like, kind of seeing the effects of imperialism on the country, what are your thoughts? That was extremely manipulative and, all in all, very messed up. Yeah. Like, to say the least, that is probably a very nice way to say that. Yeah. And so, um, what you end up happening too is that, along with the previous uh, individuals in South Asia, and other Asian countries, which had been um, coerced and driven to become part of the coolie trade, you also see that now happening in effect with China. The thing is, is that think about how this is happening. Like people are being driven out of their country because of imperialism, because of colonialism, forced to work for cheap labor in other colonies that these nations had previously set up for cheap labor, for little to nothing. They don't really have any other option to. A lot of them are being coerced, deceited, manipulated, and or forced to go onto these um, ships to be shipped off to foreign nations to work for cheap labor. Does that remind you of anything? Yeah, so a lot of the practices which went about um, 
kind of turning Asian people into cheap labor for foreign nations are the exact same processes that were used on African people because this had occurred at the right time when slavery was abolished. So a new like whole new labor hole and demand for cheap labor was sought after and like Asian people which just happened to be there at the right time with the right imperial motives. And they kind of just replace the spot of slavery, of African slavery. You can kind of see like that race dynamic working where like races are kind of set up to replace one another in terms of economic um, principles. And then going on to kind of the Chinese laborers. Uh, why do you think Chinese labor became so abundant and so prolific within America, especially like California? Mm, probably because like you said, there was that push away from the country like to move to America due to this imperialism and colonialism. And then um, there was like demand in America for that cheap labor, so yeah. So especially like the demand for the cheap labor in America, I think what a lot of people forget too is that besides like the end of slavery, like people assume that these agricultural farm owners are gonna desire Chinese people to work their land now that like they can no longer have slaves. You also think about industrial developers who also now need cheap labor. They themselves like Northern primarily were against slavery. However, they were not against cheap labor. They would desire cheap labor no matter what, people want to hire people if they can pay them for a lot less. And so because of all these like motives to push um, Chinese people out of their home country and like for these Chinese people to look for new opportunities, they get pushed into these like cheap manual labor jobs within the country, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on topics of these people being placed into the country, kind of being pushed into here, what do you think the consensus or like the opinion um, American people, white America had on Chinese people? And do you think that it was only white America that had those opinions? They were probably seen as less than, and I'm guessing it probably wasn't um, confined to white Americans who thought that way just because it's like as a society, you kind of like learn to think in similar ways. Yeah. And, um, Kind of what do you think about like the dynamic like when these chinese migrants came to the country they were working like labor jobs right how do you mm -hmm. think the dynamic worked along because then you also had a bunch of other migrants looking for jobs coming into the country because like i don't know say like the irish right you had the potato famine in ireland mm -hmm. and you have a lot of irish immigrants coming to the country trying to like find opportunity yeah um, i'm guessing that kind of like led to tension um, especially if they're like all trying to find similar work and uh, I know like with immigrants there's always the question of like oh like who's gonna work for cheaper labor and like bring down the costs lower so that you have to be like forced to be like I guess okay with like working at that price yeah and on that same topic do you think like kind of those notions like do you think they bred racism do you think they created racism? Do you think they were just kind of a byproduct of racism? Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question correctly, but I would imagine that the people in power would like create or breed like ways to bring racism about to kind of like put the different minority groups like against each other so that that way it's like more divided and they're not able to kind of like come together and like disrupt the whole like stratification. Yeah, sorry, I gave that question off a little weirdly, but that was a great answer. And why do you think like, you say like it was like the wealthy people kind of using and breeding that racial tension. Like, why do you think it was the wealthy class that did that? Because they're the people in power, and if you're in power, you want to stay in power and continue growing in that. And in order to do that, you gotta push people down. Uh -huh. And what do you think about like the position of like? There's also white laborers, 
like where do white laborers fit in into this dynamic? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure about the context, like historically about like how they were treated, but I would assume that even though they were like considered poor and like not fully a part of like the American like identity or whatnot at that point, like if they were like a different religion or something like that, they would still be considered white. And because they're white, you still have that privilege over like non-white groups. Yeah, definitely agree with you on all these things. And I, those are great answers. So um, just coming back into like some historical facts. So uh, as we're going on, like you had these class competitions, you had these class insecurities, people utilizing race in order to smith maintain like an economic status quo. Um, you also had a lot of injustices and inequality placed upon Chinese uh, migrants and Chinese workers, especially in California. And a lot of it had to do with kind of quelling this insecurity that a lot of classes had, especially for white people. So as you mentioned, like the wealthy want to stay in power. They also want to keep their workers as workers, but they also need to kind of utilize some means of doing so. And race was just happened to be like a perfect tool, I guess to say, to utilize that. And by utilizing race though, they have to concede some of their power to another group of people. And that so happens to be white laborers. This is all my opinion, by the way, like I don't like just my theory crafting hypothesis and just kind of consolidating information. But yeah. A lot of what you see in California do, deals with conceding a lot of power and a lot of privilege to white people in general, holistically, right? You have a lot of um, laws and a lot of acts that are put into place, which limit the ability of uh, Chinese migrants to move socially, to even become citizens within the U.S. Uh, California was notorious for this because there were a lot of Asian migrants coming into California, especially because of mining jobs. Um, and you'll see like as time progresses, like you hear that like mining jobs like kind of deplete, like the mines dry up. And so people move away from different jobs. For Asian, like for Asian people, it happens a bit earlier because you get different phases of technological advancements going into mining. And once the technology had reached a point where less people were needed to do the manual labor jobs and more explosives could be used instead. You have a lot of white people going in and taking those jobs and a lot of Asian people were cast aside because they no longer had to do more of like the manual dangerous jobs. Of course, it's still dangerous, but they were kind of pushed out of the industry a bit faster than say white laborers. Um, going back to kind of like California putting about a lot of laws and acts which discriminated upon um, Asian people. You had a foreign miners tax at the time, which kind of made it so that if you were a foreigner who couldn't become a citizen within the country or within the state, then you had to pay this tax. It ended up being one fourth of the revenue California was receiving, which gives into perspective like how many Asian people were really in America and how much of this prejudice and racism was applied against such a large, massive proportion and population, which kind of like goes back onto this idea of like race being based off of economics or social classes or whatnot. It kind of like so many people were Asian within California that you kind of have to think like, were the economic benefits of kind of pushing them aside, placing them at a lower class really justified based off of just solely economics or was there some prejudice in it? Like just innate prejudices, innate biases that people had against Asian people or just against races in general. Like why is race forming? Why is race used as this scapegoat, as this like means as a tool? Do people just kind of have like this innate bias to be cruel to one another, to discriminate? It also could be like in my perspective because of the violence. I'm getting far ahead of myself, but with the violence that are conducted against Asian Americans, people want to prove themselves as like hyper masculine against one another. You know, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the political imagery that you see against uh, races, especially Irish against white, against Asian, especially against Asian, it pits each other 
to be violent against one another, which kind of goes to show this like hyper masculinity part, which may tie back to like patriarchal society where mm -hmm. to prove themselves to be superior, equal or inferior of one another, you have to be weaker than and what better way to show weakness or strength than physical violence. And so I don't know, those things kind of like tie up together and kind of like make this whole complexing, complex narrative of like what race and Asian American identity is. But um, going back on track. Um, so miners, once they had been like pushed off aside to different jobs, so like Asian miners being pushed off to different jobs, uh, just like one see like where you are, like how much you know, like where do you think the industries or like what jobs do you think a lot of these like Asian people took up after mining? Mm, this is gonna be a complete guess, but I'm gonna guess like industrial jobs. Okay, so like working in a factory? Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a good guess, especially because of industrial times. Um, railroads, big one, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. right. uh, what is a stereotype for like Chinese workers that you see? Like, where do Chinese people kind of like the stereotype for where they work. Mm, yeah, I guess back then the word that would come to mind is probably railroads. Um, and I guess just in general, like not specific to this time period or anything, the notion or stereotype of Asian people would be like, oh, hardworking, keep your head down, like don't talk back type of yeah so they kind of like that domestic type mm -hmm. of work where like they're more subservient yeah it's definitely seen um i think a lot of that comes from the imagery and so it's like one more industry that a lot of asian people flock to was the laundry industry mm -hmm. like working laundry houses chinese laundries um i think this definitely ties back to like a, kind of going back to like that whole patriarchal like proving yourself hyper masculinity race everything like that um, so just as they like first starting off the railroads, that's kind of important. So with the railroads, right, like it's becoming more and more known that like a lot of the railroads, much of the railroads were built through Asian American hands. Mm -hmm. But if you see any images of like railroads historically, you will almost never see an Asian person building the railroads. In the image commemorating the completion of the railroads being built, you don't see any Asian person at all. Why do you think so? They probably just weren't part of like the image that they wanted to portray of like, oh, like American innovation that would only be with like people. Yeah. So where do you think that like places like Chinese people in like the American perspective? Inferior, like the lower classes. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to know if this comes to a shock. So after the completion of the railroads, there were a lot of political imagery depicting Asian men as a certain way. Can you guess what that portrayal was? Um, God, it can go two ways. Okay, um, I'm going to go with hyper feminine, but hyper. the other way could also be like danger like yellow peril type yeah it was more definitely the yellow peril so <laughs> i'd say follows the yellow peril where people were so afraid of like this intermingling interbreeding of intermixal racial uh between white and asian right we get a lot of mm -hmm. political imagery political cartoons showing uh asian men as sexual predators against mm -hmm. white women but going back to like this whole patriarchal route as well as the laundry industry um laundry industry of itself it's a very like tedious rough job you have hot steam coming at you a lot like people kind of undermine working in a laundry house especially now mm -hmm. because like laundry is a little bit easier than it was beforehand but think about like how rough it is to like work a steam house work everything like that um a lot of um Asian, Chinese, Asian people were pushed into the laundry industry because it was seen as something that wasn't competitive for white men. It wasn't an industry that white men wanted to flock to 
because it was seen as feminine. And so going back to that whole patriarchal route where kind of race plays on patriarchy, hypermasculinity to prove one race being superior, inferior one another, utilizing the imagery of Asian men working in laundry houses, as well as that fear of yellow girl of intermingling, a lot of imagery comes about which emasculate and demasculates men to becoming much more feminine, hyperfeminine, as you were saying. And what do you think about that? Like kind of the origins of where like this hyper feminine Asian male comes from. Okay, I didn't know that was kind of like the root of it, but I can definitely like see it's, I guess, like impact today and how there's like a lot of pressure to, I guess, like act a certain way in that like masculinity equals power and all constructs that we should try to, what's it called? Like, D, you know, bring down. Yeah. Um, but then kind of like going back on it, like, don't you think it's weird now that you see this image? Let me try to go back to it. This image, right? Where you have this like interracial mingling, right? So why do you think it's like this type of relation can exist, yet following the construction of the railroad, you get depictions of Asian people being beastal, being like predators, and then subsequently being hyperfeminine, undesirable? Mm. Let me go back to this picture. I'm guessing it has to be like the context because I guess like in the later one, there was more, like maybe more at stake in regards to power and yeah, in regards to like power and who gets like that larger share of like power in society. Whereas maybe in the case of the Manila men, um, it was like still earlier on in those like boundaries and like racial like inequities weren't really like made yet or like created yet so at that point they didn't really like think about it as much and like you said they did identify as white at that point so maybe there was that play in it mm -hmm. okay. so going back here um yeah so you see like a lot of kind of just like the racial biases and prejudices being developed because of all the circumstances leading up to this time period, economic wise, social wise. And yeah, do you think that like the economy was the root of where all these like racial biases come from though? I will say, this is a complex question. Like <laughs> my professor just brought it up in class today. I came like fresh out of lecture like two hours ago, one hour ago, just hearing this and like, just kind of the explanation, the conversations people had. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So there's no yeah. one right way to go about it. I mean, I would say so. It seems like capitalism and imperialism and colonialism and like race and everything, patriarchy are at the core of all, all horrors in society. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it would make sense because then if the economy and like trying to like one up each other in regards to like money and power and things like that, that would cause a reason to like push one group up, whereas like other groups down. So I guess, yeah, I would say that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think like the conversation we kind of had was that the economy or just job insecurity and everything like that, just some um, class mm -hmm. competition, job insecurity, and just this competition between these migrant classes and immigrants. Uh, people said that it wasn't necessarily like the, it was possibly the cause of violence, but it wasn't the cause of racism per se. Racism was something that was much more like pre-established and mm -hmm. kind of like the economic insecurities just perpetuated it, made it more prevalent. Um, because then like something else is like, you have a lot of societies before and if race was something that was a byproduct of the economy, how do you explain for 
the Greeks calling people who don't speak Greek barbarians um, and other historic ancient societies exhibiting like forms of like racism and prejudice and discrimination. Yeah. So yeah, complex. If you want to say something, you can, but I don't really expect anything because I don't really, I wouldn't really <laughs> know what to say about those things. Yeah, I don't really know either. It's, everything seems to be like touching on each other and like intersecting. But yeah, I guess like in group mentality makes sense in that case too. It has to do with like the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, and one last subject about uh, Chinese laborers. There was one other interest industry that they really proliferated and were quite successful in, and that was the fishing and shrimping industry. Does that surprise you? Not really. To be honest, it surprised me. It was like fishing, shipping. That seems like straight <laughs> out of left field. Like, what? <laughs> but um, yeah, so like uh, Asians in these industries prove themselves to be like some of the best fishers, right? But mm -hmm. this is when you start seeing like a lot of racism occurring and without really any kind of economic demonstrations or really, really like purposes that show like um, by discriminating, discriminating against Asians, it helps the economy in any way or does this or that because like Asian people being really good at fishing, bringing themselves a lot of wealth, possibly bringing a lot of the state wealth too. This was a lot in California, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. There'd be really no reason why that they would have to like discriminate or bar against Asians versus other people in the state. But that is essentially what you see happening in um, the 20th century. Uh, California bans the usage of the nets which Chinese Asians were using to capture fish. And then subsequently in the 1970s, uh, fishing and shrimping grounds, which were previously used by these Asian American people, were reowned and reclassified as state owned property, which pushed out like completely eliminated these individuals from the fishing and shrimping industry. And it's just kind of curious to see those things because you kind of see like just racism in play mm -hmm. at hand because there wasn't really talk of a lot of um, competition between white fishermen versus Asian fishermen. You just see blatant discrimination and blatant prejudice against Asian people in these industries. Yeah. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I didn't actually know about that. So that's pretty wild since seems like you know if they're doing really well they would be helping the economy but at this point it just seems like oh like we don't want to see this group succeed so we're gonna like put down all these rules to like not let that happen mm -hmm. right and so kind of just wrapping these things up knowing everything now and just like what we just talked about how would you describe the treatment of <laughs> this is early American, sorry, early Asian Americans and just like early Asian migrants in general. Like, any thoughts about what we just talked about? Yeah, it seems, or it doesn't seem, it, it was all very like unfair and all very like racially motivated, I would say. Um, so any treatment against them was kind of like using the different races to be like, oh, because you're Asian you deserve like this and this treatment and you don't deserve like these rights or this like equal um treatment so yeah like it wasn't it wasn't necessarily surprising because we all kind of knew history is just bad like that sorry for my lack of like good words to use there um but i i did definitely learn like things that I didn't know, like in regards to that history. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's pretty much all I had. Thank you for being an amazing guest. And yeah. Cool, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing and stop recording.